There's a day when we will have no more tears, God. We just praise you for that. So um, I've been reading through the Old Testament here. That's kind of my goal that I've had is just to study through the Old Testament from Genesis to the end um, and just kind of trying to approach it, looking at it from a, a, as God as an author. Um, and looking at, and obviously it's more than just, a, the Bible is more than just a piece of literature, but approaching, as I begin to, I begin approaching the Bible as a piece of literature, so many things have popped out. And one of the, there's this, this narrative tension throughout the Old Testament where God is, on the one hand, is absolutely loves his people that he has chosen. And yet on the flip side, on the other hand, he also absolutely despises what they're doing and hates their sin. And there's this absolute tension where God in one minute is just doing these incredibly loving things for his people, incredibly forgiving things for these people. And then on the other hand, he, they're sinning and he punishes it. And he comes down extremely heavy on it in ways that I, that honestly sometimes don't make sense to me even, that are that are because of, we, of God's standard f- high standard beyond our own that we cannot comprehend how much he desires justice and yet also how much of his character is wrapped up in his mercy and this tension between these two things builds and builds and builds and points to the need at where it all culminates in the uh, with Jesus Christ on the cross and I, I've been thinking a lot about just that tension a lot lately, and I think it's correlates in this song where we are, the, where um, we know that that tension of of God's need for justice, where He poured that out on His Son for us, and we no longer have to experience that, and we can now draw boldly before the grown above. We, we can draw near to God at His throne, where we are going to be able to be with Him. Where right now we can draw close to Him because of that gospel truth. That tension has been removed from us. Uh, that because God poured that out onto his son. So I just encourage us, let's praise God for that here today. Uh, as we sing the words to this next song, just about, um, about, the, about um, God um, taking that away, from, taking away that tension, our sin from us, and pouring that out on us. So let's praise Jesus for that today. Before the throne of God above, I have a strong and perfect plea, a great high priest whose name is love, whoever lives at He's for me. My name is graven on his hands. My name is written on his heart. I know that while in heaven he stands, no tongue can bid me thence depart. 
Not a song can be beneath and steep When Satan tempts me to despair And tells me of the guilt within Upward I look and see him there Who made an end to all my sin Because the sinless Savior died My sinful soul is counted free justice satisfied to look on him and pardon me to look on him and pardon me Him there, the risen lamb, my perfect spotless righteousness, the great unchangeable I am, the King of glory and of grace, the King of glory. are hid with you, Father God, that, that we don't need to despair anymore, that, so that, that uh, we have no, we have an advocate advocating on our behalf that has taken our penalty for us, and that we can now have oneness with you, Father Lord. And we just praise you for that. We pray for the rest of our time that it would draw us closer to you and help us understand that gospel truth more. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you guys for worshiping with us today. You guys can go and have a seat and greet somebody nearby. Well, good morning. Uh, I just want to say what an honor it is, what a privilege to praise the Lord with all of you this morning. It's refreshing to my soul, so thank you that I can be part of it. And um, I only wish it could be all of us, uh, those of you watching at home. I wish we could all be here together. Um, but I am just so pleased that we are still all singing the same songs and worshiping the same God. Um, I'd like to read for you Ephesians chapter 1 this morning. It says, in love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. So I read here that God the Father has freely given us Jesus Christ, and we're to be praiseworthy for that. That's, that is a praiseworthy act. It's a glorious act that he gave us grace through Jesus Christ. And um, we read here that... It is um, a revealing of his kind will towards us. It says that he loves us like a father loves his children. And so that is the same love that he had when he predestined us. It's the same love we have right now today. 
and it's an everlasting thing, whether we feel it or not. God loves us even when the world is falling apart. He loves us even when we're sinful instead of righteous. He loves us whether we're having a good day or a bad day. He loves us even when, and you fill it in however you need to, however you want to this morning. It's true. He loves you. He loves me. He loves us. So we'll uh, take a moment here. We'll celebrate Christ's death in communion and uh, thank him for the love that he has given us through his son Jesus and praise him for that. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that your motivation towards us is love. That since the beginning of anything, you've predestined us for adoption. Thank you that you've made us your children. Thank you that we have this opportunity this morning to praise you for that. That is praiseworthy. We do praise the glorious grace you've given us through your son, Jesus. And uh, we just say thank you that you hear our prayer. We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I echo Ben's greeting. It's good to see all of you this morning, and uh, welcome back to New Life Community Church. With this being the week of Thanksgiving, of course, uh, our church schedule looks a little bit different, so those of you that are normally participating uh, for Wednesday night programs for Awaken and Awana, those are postponed for this Wednesday. Please come on back in a couple of weeks. This morning, we're continuing to give you an update on our mission's work and future desires in Nepal and in India. Reminder that for the next couple of weeks, we'll be sharing some additional information with you. And then uh, a slight change of our plans, we will go ahead and begin actually collecting your offering for that missions work the first two Sundays of December. So we had originally talked about doing that the last week of November, which would have been um, next Sunday. So we're just going to delay that one week and uh, collect the offering the first two Sundays in December. We're pleased to share with you this morning a, a video from Pastor Harka. Uh, Harka is ministering in Nepal. Uh, last week you saw a video from Chairman Hanuk. Uh, so Harka and Hanuk are 
working side by side with each other, uh, doing similar ministry together, and we'd like to share his testimony about uh, how New Life has benefited him in the past years and some things that he'd like to look forward to this year with our help. So, John, go ahead. Greetings from Kathmandu, Nepal. I'm Pastor Harka. I'm married. My wife name is Sova. My daughter name is Bula. My son is Bardhan Kharka. Uh, I, I serve in different capacities in Kathmandu, Nepal. I'm based in Kathmandu and working throughout the countries and also part of uh, Asian uh, networks. Um, I am involved uh, and serving and networking with the different churches. And uh, past two years, uh, we have uh, conducted two church planting and harvest conferences, uh, which includes of 300 uh, plus uh, 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 plus attendees, uh, three to five hundred uh, plus attendees uh, for church planting uh, initiatives. And uh, but we have a huge huge plans, and we have already printed and distributed. Uh, 200 plus uh, as book of essentials and we plan to print uh, another 4,000 uh, essentials and then have a uh, five uh, regional conferences, provincial conferences for church planting and leadership conferences in, in coming days. And we'd also like to have uh, um, church planters moving into different locations. We like to uh, send and uh, for church planters and uh, work among missions and uh, strengthening the churches in the country of Himalayas. I also do have a different uh, necessities in, in, in my families, in my personal ministries as I am involved. Uh, my daughter is studying, uh, trying to study and praying for studying, going to nursing and she needs uh, support and uh, I also do need the support to coordinate these uh, programs and ministries and I'm a volunteer pastor also uh, serving and helping and uh, teaching so that's also uh, my need. In COVID uh, we have seen 100 plus, 100,000 plus cases growing in the countries and, uh, and uh, Kathmandu is becoming a hot spot for COVID cases. Please do pray for us. Uh, that we may uh, survive, uh, also help others to survive uh, in physically and spiritually in other areas. And uh, uh, please do pray for our persecuted churches in this country. We have uh, different cases going on in the countries because of persecutions. People are suffering, churches are suffering. Please do remember. So if you, uh, if you caught the big message from the last couple of weeks from Harka and Hanok, it is that a big way that New Life is supporting uh, the countries there and the ministry that's taking place there is to allow these pastors to come together and uh, attend a pastor's conference where they're equipped uh, to plant churches throughout Nepal. Uh, another big part of that strategy is to be able to print Pastor Kurt's Essentials material to give each of those pastors a copy of that so that they can not only learn from it themselves, but then be prepared to teach that to the house churches that are being planted across the country. Let's go ahead and take a moment to pray for Hanok and for Harka, and then uh, Pastor Kurt will come on up and, and provide this morning's teaching. Father, we do want to thank you for the special relationship that you've given to us uh, for a church like New Life Community Church, a relatively small church in eastern Iowa to have such an impact on people in countries that most of us will never visit, uh, countries that we may not even know where they're at if we didn't have a map hanging in the front of the church building that we could point at and, and become familiar with the area. Father, we recognize that... Uh, those cultures, those countries are very different from the United States. Most of us don't have any idea what it would really mean for a Christian to be persecuted. We, we feel pressure, perhaps, in our, in our culture, in our workplaces, but pressure and persecution are not the same thing. Um, so we ask for protection for those that we love there, for those that we support there. 
We ask uh, not only for their spiritual protection, but even their their physical protection as that area of the world uh, deals with the same virus that we deal with here in the United States. The difference is that uh, we just pray that they would be fed, that they would have a way of, of taking care of their families. Father, we, uh, we want to dedicate the next couple of weeks to continuing to pray and to understand how each one of us individually and his families can participate in this ministry and help these men, help these pastors, help these churches to do your will and to expand the kingdom of God in this age. We thank you for giving us the privilege to be a part of it. In Christ's name, amen. Kurt? It's a little hard for me to see these brothers on the video screens. I miss them. They're dear friends. Uh, Subash, Hanak, and Harka. Um, <laughs> is that me? <laughs> Um, I just miss them. I did see them, all, all of them, this last February this year, so I'm grateful for that. But uh, I'm just looking forward to be able to see them again in person. These are such dear people. Harka's wife and his children are precious. And Testing, one, two, three. All right, give me the handheld. Thank you. Oh, Brian's got it. All right. Thank you very much. <clears throat> a few years ago, a 17-year-old young man here at New Life Community Church worked very hard for several months, including a summer. That fall, we had our annual missions campaign here, and he gave $10,000. I happen to know that that was literally about everything he had. And some might be tempted to think that was foolish. Didn't he need to start thinking about saving up for college or buying a car? $10,000 would have been a great foundational, financial foundation for a young man to build on. But he gave it all away. Dr. Subash happened to be visiting at the time. I told him of the young man's gift and Subash wanted to thank him personally. Now, when you see Subash on the video last week on camera, uh, reading a script in front of the camera, <clears throat> he, uh, he might seem pretty stoic, and most Indian pastors are. But when Subash met this young man, he hugged him, then he started to cry. And with those tears in his eyes, he turned to me and said, we will tell this story to everyone in our conferences. And we did. Hundreds of Indian pastors heard the story of a young American man who, when asked why he gave so much to help them, replied, they need it more than I do. That is an example of radical giving. And my primary point today is God expects radical giving of his people. So what is radical giving? Well, one day Jesus was at the temple and he witnessed it. Luke records, while Jesus was in the temple, he watched the rich people dropping their gifts into the collection box. Then a poor widow came by and dropped in two small coins. I tell you the truth, Jesus said, this poor widow has given more than all the rest of them, for they have given a tiny part of their surplus. But she, poor as she is, has given everything she has. We look at that, and it is easy to praise this woman for her faith. This looks like a good Christian thing to do. Give everything you have. But if we went to our Christian, even our Christian financial advisor, and told them we were giving everything we have, they would tell us we were crazy. I have some, some radical things to say today about giving, so just bear with me. But in my opinion, most popular American Christian wisdom, Christian wisdom about financial management is unbiblical. For some, you would think the greatest commandment in Scripture is to pay off your mortgage. There are no commandments in the Bible against being in debt to a bank, especially when real estate might be a great investment. 
Other Christians have made it almost a biblical commandment to have emergency savings, retirement investments, and an inheritance for their children. Nowhere are these things commanded in Scripture. On one level, these can all be good and wise things. Do not misunderstand me, but let's not claim they are commanded in Scripture. What is encouraged in Scripture is radical giving. Listen, if the widow's example doesn't make you feel a little uncomfortable about your giving, then you don't understand. Listen again to what Jesus said. For they, the rich people, have given a tiny part of their surplus, but she, poor as she is, has given everything she has. I'm a little reluctant to press this point this morning because our church members have been so very generous. I do not want to suggest that either I or Jesus do not greatly appreciate that generosity. This message convicted me this week. Jesus said the rich people gave a tiny part of their surplus. That's how the New Living Translation translates the little, little, literal Greek that they gave out of their wealth. A tiny part of their surplus accurately represents what happened. And it is so easy for us rich Americans to do the same. We give a tiny part of our surplus. And we think it is generous because it can be a large amount. More than a poor person can give. But God is not evaluating our giving based on the amount, is he? Jesus said this poor widow gave more than all the rich people because it was such a higher percentage of her wealth than they gave. It was everything she had as opposed to their giving out of their surplus. Again, I have to say I was personally convicted as I put this message together this week. Like many of you, I believe I give generously. But am I giving radically like that young man I told you about or like this widow? There's a difference between generous giving, which comes out of our surplus, and radical giving that actually costs us something. I don't think God is expecting anyone to give everything we have to the temple as the widow did or which would, in our modern Christian context would be the local church. Although I ask myself the question, if the widow could give her everything she had to the temple, why can't I? Does Jesus literally want all of us to give everything we have to the work and service of the temple or the local church? Maybe not. But Jesus wanted this story recorded to encourage his followers about radical giving. Let me put it this way. If our giving doesn't hurt somehow, it's not radical. If our giving does not somehow at least temporarily affect our standard of living, it's not radical. If our giving sacrifices nothing, it's not radical. If we are just giving a tiny, sur tiny part of our surplus, our giving is something less than God wants. Radical giving is praised elsewhere in Scripture. Listen to the example of the first century Christians in Macedonia. The Apostle Paul wrote, Now I want you to know, dear brothers and sisters, what God in his kindness has done through the churches of Macedonia. They are being, test being tested by many troubles, and they are very poor. But they are also filled with abundant joy, which has overflowed to rich generosity. For I can testify, listen, I can testify that they gave not only what they could afford, but far more. They gave more than they could afford. <laughs> and they did it of their own free will. They begged us again and again for the privilege of sharing in the gift for the believers in Jerusalem, who were about a thousand miles away, by the way. They even did more than they had hoped, for their first action was to give themselves to the Lord and to us, just as God wanted them to do. Paul says these Christians were living in difficult times and being tested by many troubles. That kind of sounds like us. I think uh, in our current day, <laughs> we're being tested. There's a lot of troubles. But unlike us, the Macedonians did not live in a rich country. They were poor. But they had a joy in the Lord that overflowed into radical giving. And Paul says they gave far more than they could afford. But they did not view that as a burden. They thought it was a blessing, a privilege to give to needy Christians they had never met and who lived in some faraway land. And what enabled them to do this was they gave themselves 
to God first, to trust and love him. And their commitment to God and their love and trust for God resulted in their commitment to give to these other Christians. But again, their giving was radical. Paul says they gave far more than they could afford. No Christian financial advisor, even a pastor, is going to tell you to give far more than you can afford. We just wouldn't do that. But that's what these Christians did. And it's presented in God's word as an example to us. God expects radical giving from us. Again, this kind of radical giving seems foolish. To give all you have to the temple or to give far more than you can afford to some needy Christians, on one hand, we recognize the nobility of that. But inside of us, there are all kinds of objections. Giving all you have or more than you can afford seems foolish, irresponsible, and even borderline dangerous, if we're honest, which is why we need to go back to the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus addresses all of our concerns about radical giving. Let me read what he said in this lengthy passage from Matthew chapter 6. Don't store up treasures here on earth, where moths eat them and rust destroys them, and where thieves break in and steal. Store your treasures in heaven, where moths and rust cannot destroy, and thieves do not break in and steal. Because wherever your treasure is, or the desires of your heart will also be. No one can serve two masters. For you will hate one and love the other. You will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and be enslaved to money. That is why I tell you, do not worry about everyday life. Whether you have enough food and drink or enough clothes to wear, isn't life more than food and your body more than clothing? Look at the birds. They don't plant or harvest or store food in barns, for your heavenly Father feeds them. And aren't you far more valuable to him than they are? Can all your worries add a single moment to your life? And why worry about clothing? Look at the lilies of the field and how they grow. They don't work or make their clothing, yet Solomon in all his glory was not dressed as beautifully as they are. And if God cares so wonderfully for wildflowers that are here today and thrown in the fire tomorrow, he will certainly care for you. Why do you have so little faith? So don't worry about these things, saying, what will we eat? What will we drink? What will we wear? These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers. Well, your heavenly father already knows all your needs. So seek first the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously and he will give you everything you need. It will take me a couple messages to work through this amazing passage. That's why I've asked us all to wait to decide what we will give for this missions campaign until we've talked about all that Jesus is saying here. Jesus is giving us some amazing promises and I think these promises will encourage us and make us less afraid and even excited about radical giving. And if you trust these promises, we will be excited instead of afraid to give radically. The first promise Jesus gives us is that you will be greatly rewarded in the next world. The second promise is that you will always be taken care of in this world. And for the remainder of this message, I want to discuss the first promise. In the next message, I'll discuss the second promise. I would paraphrase Jesus' first promise this way. <laughs> this is going to sound a little odd. Your giving in this world purchases influence and property in the new world. I know that sounds a little crazy, but stay with me. What if I told you that everything you give to your church and our missions will yield a 10,000% return? I did not say a 10% return, which would be considered very good in our current economy. I said a 10,000% return. And what if I told you that with that 10,000% return, we are purchasing land and properties and mansions on a beautiful Caribbean island where we all are going to retire together? Sounds like a pretty sweet deal, doesn't it? Something you would be excited about? I know it can also sound like something one of those wacko, lying, greedy televangelists might say. But don't let their perversion of Jesus' promises keep you from understanding and trusting them. These promises are real. And my analogy about retirement estates in the Caribbean are nothing compared to the real promises Jesus has for those who give radically. Jesus said, don't store up treasures here on earth where moths eat them and rust destroys them and where thieves break in and steal 
Store your treasures in heaven where moths and rust cannot destroy and thieves do not break in and steal. Wonderful promise. Amazing promise. Talking about treasures in heaven. Unfortunately, it doesn't mean much to us because we don't know what treasures in heaven really mean. And because the meaning of the pro this promise of treasures is unclear, the value of this promise to us is unclear and diminished. Let me try to help us with that this morning. Jesus is saying that God gives you the opportunity to acquire valuable things now for you to enjoy on a new earth forever. What will those valuable things be? We get a little better picture of what those treasures will be later in Matthew chapter 19. In verse 21, Jesus tells a rich man, Go and sell your possessions and give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. There it is again, treasure in heaven. Now, Peter was listening to this, and he heard what Jesus said. And like us, he started wondering what treasure in heaven really meant. So a few verses later, Peter asked Jesus about this in verse 27. Then Peter said to him, we've given up everything to follow you. What will we get? That sounds just like Peter, doesn't it? Straight to the point. <laughs> he just heard Jesus promise a rich man treasure in heaven if he gave his money. Peter's thinking, I've given up everything to follow Jesus. And so he asked Jesus, what will I get? To us, this question seems selfish and petty. Even worldly and materialistic. Shouldn't Peter just be glad to serve Jesus with no reward? And we think the same. But throughout Scripture, there is a promise, there is promise after promise after promise of incredible eternal rewards on the new earth for our service and sacrifice to God on this earth. But you know what? Most Christians don't care. Most Christians are rarely motivated to give and serve because they are thinking of God's reward. Why don't eternal rewards matter much to us? Why are we rarely motivated by that? Why do we think the whole rewards thing sounds selfish, petty, and even worldly? Because we have not sacrificed or given enough. That's why. What did Peter say? We've given up everything to follow you. When following Christ has cost you everything, then those promised rewards will mean a lot more to you. Imagine you sold a multi-million dollar business, gave it all to Christian causes, and as a result, had to live in a two-bedroom apartment. Losing that much might help you value the promises of being eternally rewarded. When following and serving Christ costs you a lot, believe me, those eternal rewards will mean a lot more to you. And only when you give radically, when you give all you have or give far more than you can afford, like the Macedonian Christians, only then... When your giving hurts, then this promise of treasure in heaven will mean more to you as well. These kind of promises are for those who give a lot. Peter said, we've given up everything to follow you. What will we get? And contrary to what some might think, Jesus did not rebuke him. Instead, he promised him something amazing. Jesus replied, I assure you. You see, he's promising here. I assure you that when the world is made new and the Son of Man sits upon his glorious throne, you have, who have been my followers will also sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. And everyone who has given up houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or property for my sake will receive 100 times as much in return and will inherit eternal life. So we can see that earlier I was not exaggerating. I said the return on investment of what, whatever we give to the kingdom will be 10,000%. That's 100 times as Jesus promised. Now, in one sense, it's difficult to interpret Jesus here in a completely literal way. How could we have 100 mothers in the new world? Would we even want 100 mothers in a new world? In one sense, Jesus is probably using hyperbole here to assure Peter that whatever he gives up for the sake of Jesus and his work on earth will result in much, much more, quote, when the world is made new, the new world. But there's some very literal and real things being promised here. First, Jesus promises greater influence in the coming new world. These guys are going to be ruling over the new nation of Israel. Jesus speaks of this same thing elsewhere. In Luke 19, Jesus tells a parable 
about a king who gives his servants some money to, quote, put to work. When the king returns, the servants report how they put his money to work. When a servant reports he earned 10 times what the king gave him, the king replies, well done. You are a good servant. You've been faithful with the little I entrusted to you, so you will be governor of 10 cities as your reward. Jesus means for us to interpret this literally. The Old Testament prophets tell us clearly that in the new world, there will be nations, kings, cities, and towns. And those nations, cities, and towns will be led and cared for by people. Now, some of you are not motivated by this promise. You, again, think the promise of influence in the new world sounds selfish. But think about how much good you could do. The people in charge in the new world are not going to be lording it over people, but will be the greatest of servants. Part of the joy that we will experience in the new world will come from how local leaders bless us. And you can be one of those leaders. You can lead 10 cities to be among the most giving and God-glorifying cities in the new world. That's what Jesus is promising. Sounds kind of gaudy, doesn't it? But again, if you've given up everything, it starts making sense. Jesus went on the promise, everyone who has given up houses or property for my sake will receive 100 times as much in return. Again, I believe this should be interpreted literally. He's talking about real houses and real property in the new world. And I believe we should interpret Jesus literally because the Old Testament prophets again promised there will be real property and real houses in the new world. In past teachings, I have tried to help us have a very physical understanding of what life will be like on the new earth. It's not just floating in the clouds. It's going to be on a new earth with real dirt, real fields, real houses. And again, the Old Testament prophets tell us there will be these fields and work and houses and property. When David was looking forward to the kingdom of God on the new earth, he said to God, quote, The land you have given me there is a pleasant land. What a wonderful inheritance. The original Hebrew here implies, implies boundary lines for portions of land being marked out for people. And an inheritance in the Old Testament as well as in ancient cultures included land. An angel told Daniel, you will rest and then at the end of the days you will rise to receive your allotted inheritance and so will you, Christian, which in Old Testament language certainly includes land to live on. That's biblical. The promise of an eternal allotment of physical land on the new earth is a repeated and important promise from God to his Old Testament saints. I could give you a dozen Old Testament verses about this. God promises people land over and over again. Just give you a couple examples. First Chronicles, God says, I will provide a place for my people Israel and will plant them so that they can have a home of their own and no longer be disturbed. Isaiah 32, my people will live in peaceful dwelling places in secure homes and undisturbed places of rest. He wants to give them home, a home in a new land. And the same will be true for us. And evidently, we will have a home on those new lands. While Jesus is certainly preparing a new world and earth for us to live in, Scripture indicates one of the things you will do is actually build a home. <laughs> Isaiah 65. This is after God has created the new heavens and new earth. He's talking about the new earth. And in, God says, in those days, people will live in the houses they build and eat the fruit of their own vineyards. That's very real, that's very physical, and this is after the creation of the new heavens and the new earth. It would seem in some sense we will all be pioneers and homesteaders in a new and beautiful land. If we are going to honor and value such promises from Jesus, we have to use our God-given imaginations. We have to have pictures in our mind of what we are sacrificing for, what we are giving for, and how we will be rewarded. Jesus specifically mentioned property and houses among those rewards. Now, it's typical for Christians for Christian to say something like, I just want a shack in heaven. I don't need a mansion. That sounds humble, but it dishonors Christ. He wants you to have the most you can in the new world because of how you live in this new world. I'm sorry, how you live in this world. I think literally some of the houses, property, and lands we have on the new earth might look like these. If you think these are too fancy and grand, remember that the New Jerusalem 
that will be the capital of the new world will have streets made of real gold and gates made of real pearls. What sinful man has been able to build in this world will not compare to what we will build in a new world. I can assure you of that. And what you will build there and what you will have there will depend on how you live and give in this world. That's what Jesus is saying. What kind of property do you think that widow will have who gave those two coins? She's going to be famous in a new world. Where she lives will be a tourist attraction. She's going to have this humongous, beautiful mansion on top of this beautiful, gorgeous mountain. And people are going to stand at the bottom of that mountain. They're going to look up and say, gee, I wish I had given everything I had. What about that young man who gave just about everything he had? I am looking very forward to seeing what that $10,000 bought him in the new world. Jesus encouraged us to store up treasures in heaven, treasures that we can enjoy for all eternity These treasures are not just spiritual. They will be physical. More specifically, I believe the scriptures support my paraphrase of Jesus' promise that your giving in this world purchases influence and property in the new world, which is just one reason God expects our giving to be radical. We don't have a specific goal for our missions campaign because it is not primarily about meeting a financial goal. This missions campaign is not primarily even about the needs I described last week or giving to these wonderful people. This missions campaign is about, first and foremost, our love and trust for God. That's what this is about. I can assure you that whatever you give will be invested in kingdom work, but the needs are endless. What really matters is that God will appreciate what you give as a very real demonstration of your love for him and trust in him. We'll talk more about that next week. Take a moment with the person next to you to discuss what was meaningful about this message, and I'll end in a moment in prayer.
Lord Jesus, you have a way of challenging, challenging us down to our very soul. Um, I, uh, I do believe the people of New Life are so very generous. What I'm learning this week is there's a difference between generous giving and radical giving. There's a difference in my own life. And I'm asking you for myself, for our friends, for our, our members here, You'd help us to understand that difference as well and apply it and to trust you enough to give radically instead of just generously. To give something that we need and have to depend on you to supply it. Um, We're just grateful for these promises. Lord, we confess to you they don't make a lot of sense to us. (laughs) It's just hard to even think about mansions on on the new earth. But those promises are there, and you put them there for a purpose and a reason, and they're true. Help us to value them and help them to affect our lives in the way that you wanted them to. You wanted those promises to affect our lives and the way we live and what we give. I pray that they would. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Have a God week. Hope to see you back here next week.